We continue to deal with the lasting impact of the pandemic, including where we work, how we work, and the way we interact socially, and of course, how we learn. And now it turns out the ways students can cheat. Susie Weiss uh, from the Free Press has new reporting out uh, and a piece called The Dishonor Code, What Happens When Cheating Becomes the Norm. It covers how college students across the country are cheating at massive levels, with one student arguing, quote, it's a disadvantage not to cheat. Susie, thank you so much for being with us. Horrifying stuff for parents. I, I but, know. But there's so many things here, including uh, AI apps that allow students who know how to use them to just put in the right questions and come up with term papers. So talk about your article. How uh, did the pandemic make cheating uh, so much more prevalent on campus? Well, thank you so much for having me today. I think we think of cheating as the exception to the rule, but increasingly it's becoming the rule. Uh, and that's really because of the incentives at play here. Professors are incentivized to keep their head down, get tenure, get good student evaluations. Students are incentivized, of course, to take the path of least resistance to their high paying job so that they might begin to pay down the debt they took on in the first place to go to college. Colleges are motivated by rankings, by tuition dollars, by grant dollars. And so you have this perfect storm where uh, professors feel hugely demoralized. They're treating students more like customers than mm -hmm. they are students. Uh, and at the end of the day, like Joe said, you know, I had a student tell me that she's getting screwed over for not cheating. And, you know, at the same time, I, I talked to a CUNY professor who said the students are like tyrants um, and that he didn't get into academia to be a cop. So it's a pretty dark situation out there. Eddie, you're a professor who cares more about just tenure, we know. <laughs> I got a little shots you were taking at Eddie. I mean, oh, I didn't know I was, I was so uncomfortable. I was sitting, sitting at a table with all Ivy League men. I would have edited the piece oh a little. God. No, I, I think you're right to describe the market pressures, and, and those market pressures evidence themselves in so many different ways, and particularly around competition, not only to get in, but how one performs when you're there. What is the nature of assessment here, though? It seems to me that as things have changed, whether it's chat GPT or, or, or the market pressures that you've just described, it seems to me that universities and colleges have to figure out how to do their work differently, that I have to figure out how mm. to assess whether students are learning the material differently. How, what do you think about what this suggests about universities in the 21st century? Yeah, I think one side of it is assessment and the other side of it is kind of a shifting idea of what exactly college is for. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's really about students learning to think differently and deeply anymore. I think it's a transactional relationship where they're looking to get a credential so they could get a job at a consulting firm or even find a spouse and have a fancy life. None of those are necessarily bad things, but uh, I think it doesn't pretend good things when um, students, especially on elite campuses, don't see cheating as something that's necessarily a moral wrong. Mm. Yeah, you know, Eddie, I wanted to follow up with you on this because as, as a professor, you can, you can help us out. And, and I, I, um, it, it is so concerning uh, where you have professors who are concerned uh, about their evaluations, especially professors who aren't tenured. And I've heard this from not only professors, but also students, uh, associate professors, where it's almost like, the students are customers. I know I'm an old guy from state school, but we weren't the customers. We were the students. And, you know, when, when a professor talked, we sat there and we wrote notes and would have a good open debate. But I never knew a professor in undergrad at Alabama or at law school at Florida who gave a damn about my evaluation. They were going to teach their course and I was going to learn it. And if I didn't, if I didn't do well on the exam, they had no problems giving me C's, and they did, often. Oh, Joe, you sound like you own a Rolodex. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I mean, it's, it's serious. When we think about uh, expansion at universities and colleges right now, it's happening at the level of administration, at the level of student services. Uh, there's this idea that butts and seats actually define whether or not departments will get funded, right? How your classes are populated, what, how you're evaluated impacts uh, the way in which you're uh, assessed uh, as you move up the ranks in the professoriate. And what's interesting is that there's a correlation, I think, between our openness to lies mm. 
right? And the way in which we're looking at this, Susie, right? So if you see that supposedly universities and colleges are the last bastion of liberalism, we often talk about them as the space for wokeness where people are virtue signaling. And now we're hearing that these folks don't give a damn about cheating. Suddenly something is going on. So the notion of decency, the notion of the honor code, the notion of what it means to be a certain kind of thoughtful human being, right, is under attack, under pressure in a number of different sectors. And Joe, it has something to do with how we deliver to these folk who are paying increasingly high amounts of tuition. They want their money's worth and we have to deliver for them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and with those pressures, uh, Susie, you know, the, the, the students are paying so much, astronomical. We know mm -hmm. that the cost of to college tuition has far, far eclipsed uh, uh, the rate of inflation over the last few decades. There is this pressure, that transaction to get that diploma, to get that good job, to help yeah. in part pay off those loans. Uh, so talk a little bit, you mentioned it briefly earlier, but the AI, the chat GPT and these other things that are making cheating easier, uh, and perhaps some professors turning a blind eye towards it. Uh, what are schools that do care about this? What, what steps are they trying to take? Right. I mean, you know, I think it's too early to say whether AI is going to totally topple academia. I think some of the professors I talked to talked about it like the final nail in the coffin. Uh, other professors described it sort of like, you know, any type of cheating. You know, if a student wants to learn, they're going to learn. Uh, and if they uh, want to cheat, they're going to cheat. Right. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, with ChatGPT, and this is kind of a holdover from the pandemic, is that it's become compassionate to have endlessly lax standards, to extend those deadlines, to you know not really bust a student and certainly not go to war with these ballooning bureaucracies on college campuses. I think Harvard has and many, as many undergraduates as administrators, Stanford's not far behind. So you know I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't blame a teacher for turning a blind eye. So. I don't know how AI is going to affect higher education. I do know that it's landing on campus at probably the most inopportune time. You mentioned post-pandemic. I was talking to a kid from Harvard yesterday who said pretty much colleges across the country are virtual now. Right. And this is a problem that's going to be in the workforce and that now that there's not as much human contact and you're not eye to eye, it allows for it. And the workplace also lacks behavior, inappropriate behavior. And I, I, I just think this is going to be a long-term effect, academia, workplace, when there's not eyeball to eyeball mm. and it's becoming more and more accepted. It's something I worry about a lot. Mm. Yeah, no doubt about it. I, I just, I had to look because Susie said that everybody was, um, she was around the table with all Ivy Leaguers. I was sure that like Lemire went to a good Catholic college or something. Like that. <laughs> I, I, I look and I see he earned a bachelor's degree in history from Columbia. My goodness. I mean, well, you, well, Joe, you're I've, right, Susie. The Joe, I've, I've kept my mouth shut during your Ivy League diatribes recently. <laughs> for, for good reason. <laughs> I, you know, we, we have all the fake Republican populists in the Ivy League schools that they went to. I think we need to do that for our roundtables now and get get a little the, Columbia. The penance? Penance. To do the penance? Yeah. I don't know graduate degree yeah. here, though, I will say. But, yeah, we should do so, the penance. So, Susie, I, I, I love so many of your, your, your columns. I want to ask you this uh, while I've got you here and while we're on, the, on this subject. We've ta Eddie's talked about with you all the competition for the money, getting people in the seats, how much I, I, the cost of tuition has exploded, which is just so obscene, how expensive it is, so obscene. And by the way, yes, that is fueled by an out-of-control student loan system. Mm -hmm. That needs to be completely taken down and reformed uh, from the ground up so middle class Americans uh, can, can afford going to college. But Susie, uh, so I went on that rant to talk about another part that's really disturbing me. Um, I've seen over the past several years kids desperately trying to get into colleges that five years ago the door would have been open and they would have been waved right into. Mm. Like something really strange is happening. Kids with 4.0s, <laughs> kids that are the, like top 98% of the SAT scores, kids that have come up with scientific discoveries. Like I, I know one kid in Boston that came up with this remarkable discovery uh, at a, a science uh, consortium. Um, all with, Just resumes that would get you into any uh, university on earth five years ago uh, is sure. now getting you rejected. What, what's going on on the front end here that, that we don't understand? Yeah, well, I think in a way it's something positive. More 
high schoolers than ever see it as a chance to go to college and the competition is going to be more fierce. Columbia University, your alma mater, just yeah. got rid of the SAT and we just ran a piece by Rob Henderson who said, you know, it might do better to get rid of legacy admissions before the SAT. So I think that's a really good point. You know, I think competition is worse than ever and people are seeing the value of their degree becoming degraded in terms of the actual content that they're learning. So honestly, Joe, I wouldn't be surprised if you see people gravitating away from higher education and towards things like specialized trade schools, craft schools, um, getting their own bespoke degrees using uh, courses online from the best professors in the world. Of course, you wouldn't want a doctor or a pilot performing their job without the requisite training, but I think you know, my friend Ricky Schlott had a great piece in the New York Post this week about dropping out of NYU and, and not going back during COVID. And I think you're going to see more students taking her lead.